Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, invitation, uh, Dr. Dakshila. And uh, as the president of the College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka, I'm privileged to welcome all of you to the Journal Club today, on behalf of the council and the membership of the College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka. So as you all know, we are the apex public health professional body in the country. And uh, currently we have more than 600 membership uh, who are working nationally and internationally. And uh, this year, our theme is public health through fostering collaboration and building resilience. So I'm really thankful to the president and the council of the College of Palliative Medicine, Sri Lanka, for their collaboration uh, to conduct this journal club uh, today with yes. us. Yes. And also, well, I would like to well, extend our well, well. appreciation to all the presenters and the reviewers for your enormous support to make this event successful. And uh, once again, I warmly welcome all of you to the Journal Club today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Now I would like to invite uh, Professor Samadhi Rathapaksha, immediate past president of the College of Palliative Medicine of Sri Lanka, to say a few words. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh... Good afternoon, uh, everybody. I am joining from the Ainsing city of Anuradhapur. And let me welcome all of you on behalf of the College of Palliative Medicine of Sri Lanka and of, on behalf of our dear Madam President, Dr. Janaki Vidhanapathirana. So, and we are very happy uh, to have this opportunity with uh, as Dr. Shiromi Maduvage, the Madam President of the College of Community Physicians, mentioned, uh, this is a collaborative work. Actually, uh, as a College of Palliative Medicine of Sri Lanka, we are very happy to collaborate with the very senior and uh, very experienced college, like uh, and the apex body of public health, the doctor the College of Community Physicians this time. Last year also, we had the collaborative work. We did a very uh, good uh, systematic review uh, uh, series of systematic review, which related to palliative medicine. And you, you all of you know, the palliative medicine still uh, a growing field in Sri Lanka compared to the world, uh, the global situation. But uh, we are happy uh, the development of uh, palliative medicine uh, of Sri Lanka. Again, this kind of collaborative work is uh, gives us a great uh, opportunity and the strength. Uh, and uh, our work, I'm sure this, this is the first time we are uh, doing uh, the journal club. So I wanted to thank, uh, special thank to Dr. Buddhika Mahesh, who is our, council, our college council member uh, very actively uh, and uh, worked towards to get this journal club and uh, our Madam President's vision also and this year theme also our college is Compassionate Communities. So I hope this uh, gives us both colleges and the professionals gives us a great opportunity to improve uh, our knowledge and uh, I wish you all the success and very best. And I am very happy to welcome today two reviewers, uh, the reviewers and the presenters. So thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would also like to remind everyone that today's General Club is a hybrid session. Where all the registrars are joining from the PGN as well. So today we will discuss a very interesting and timely topic. This story has started the integration of palliative care in oncology on quality of life and healthcare to use near the end of life randomized clinical trial. The review panels for today's general club are Dr. Shantar Kalabella, senior lecturer in clinical medicine and family medicine, 
University of Morocco, Dr. Suba Pereira, Acting Consultant Community Physician, attached to the AGM, and Dr. Uthala Mohandiram, that is trying to make medicine, attached to the Enmoish office, go to the world. And the presenter for the day are Dr. Aravinda Guttram Singha, Senior Registrar in Community Medicine, attached to the Maternal Care Unit, Family Health Bureau, and Dr. Jiran Sadana Singha, which is trying to make medicine attached to the NOH office, Dr. Amunda. Now, without further ado, let us come on to the general club. Huh? Thank you, Dakshila. I'm Chiranti Singha, Registrar in Community Medicine. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank the co both colleges, College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka and uh, College of Palliative Medicine Sri Lanka for giving us this great opportunity. Uh, so today our journal uh, club is on the article, the effect of early integration of palliative care in oncology yeah on quality of life and healthcare use near the end of life, a randomized control trial. Uh, this is our presentation outline. What is a journal club and why it is important? And selecting an article, background of the article, reporting guidelines for the article, appraisal of the article, main findings of the study, and applicability of the findings to the Sri Lankan context. First of all, let's look at what is a journal club. Journal club is an educational meeting in which a group of individuals discuss current articles, uh, providing a forum for, for a collective effort to keep up with the literature. It is an internationally recognized teaching tool in postgraduate medical education for learning the latest in medical research and teaching of uh, critical appraisal skills. It is first described by Sir William Osler in 1875. Uh, the uh, journal clubs are very important to assess the quality of the article as well as to discuss the findings of the article. So when we choose an article for the journal club, we uh, mainly uh, choose this article because as this is a collaborative uh, journal club, the article should be uh, relevant to both palliative care field as well as for the public health field. And also, uh, when considering the burden of the disease, the cancer, cancer burden is very high in the country currently. And uh, the country is putting more emphasis on palliative care recently. High, uh, and uh, uh, So the importance of seeking new knowledge in this area is very important. Mm. So before going into the appraisal of the article, it is uh, good that we know what is palliative care. Uh, palliative care is a holistic approach that improves quality of life of patients and their families suffering from life-threatening illnesses by addressing physical, social, psychological, as well as spiritual problems. The concept was first introduced by a British physician, Dr. Dame Cecily Sounder, in 1948 as a hospice care. Hospice care is a uh, branch of palliative care where the palliative uh, where the patient is no longer responding to the palliative care, uh, curative care. In 1990, WHO introduced non-hospice palliative care where the palliative care interventions are introduced early, early phase in the disease uh, in concordance with the curative treatment. However, palliative care has traditionally been delivered uh, during, uh, during a latter course of the disease to the patients. Previous studies have suggested that late referrals to the palliative care are inadequate to alter the quality and delivery of care provided to patients with cancer. So the aim of this study was to examine the effect of early palliative care integrated with standard oncology care on the use of health services and quality of life near the end of life. This journal was published in European Journal of Cancer, which is a peer-reviewed journal. And uh, it has both open access as well as subscription facilities. Uh, and uh, it was indexed by major databases like PubMed, Medline, Sinal, and Embase, and with the impact factor of 8.4 and site score of 11.1. 
the uh, uh, registration in the public trial registry is a condition for publication of the cl uh, clinical trials in this journal, and the journal requires use of recognized guidelines for reporting of the research. For randomized controlled trials, they recommend consort to a 2010 guideline. Data sharing is a requirement for an article publication. These three factors show the scientific rigorousness of the journal. The article was first received on 2nd of September 2019 and accepted on 6th of November 2019 and published on the 5th of December in the same year. So the duration taken from the submission to the publication is about three months. So let's look at the selection of a guideline. There are uh, two most important checklists available for researcher and a practitioner involved in research. These are critical appraisal checklist and the reporting guidelines. Critical appraisal checklists are useful for assessment of study quality, identification of bias, and evaluation of internal validity. And reporting guidelines are useful to ensure the transparent reporting, facilitating appraisal by adhering to the reporting guidelines and identification of reporting deficiencies. So uh, we use Equator Network to identify the most suitable guideline for the reporting of this uh, randomized control trial and they suggest con consort 2010 statement. It is a 25 item checklist and uh, in the 2022, they have published an extension version for the Consort 2010 uh, checklist. There are additional 17 items that elaborate on the Consort 2010 statement checklist items, mainly item 6A, item 7A, 12A, and item 80. Uh, let's appraise the quality of the article. These are the uh, Consort 2010 uh, checklist we use. And uh, first, the title and the abstract. Uh, according to the consort guideline, they recommend to identify the study as a randomized trial in the title. Here in this article, they clearly mention it as a randomized control trial. Uh, in the uh, item 1B, that means the abstract, they uh, recommend to give a structured summary of the trial design method uh, and, uh, and results and conclusions. Description of the trial design was uh, given in the abstract as a parallel arm design and objectives and primary outcomes was clearly mentioned. The eligibility criteria was partly included in the article and they have mentioned that patients with advanced cancer and life expectancy of one year was included in this trial. But, in, but the intervention is not reported uh, in the abstract. The study setting randomization method, blinding whether done or not, was not reported in the abstract. But the number of uh, part, uh, patients randomized, recruited, and analyzed was clearly mentioned. There are the, uh, 186 patients were randomized to the two arms, but uh, the number of participants in one arm was not clearly mentioned in, the, in this abstract. Primary outcome for each group and estimated effect size and its precision was well reported. Here I, hi I have highlighted that uh, they have mentioned the quality of life at six months, three months, and one month with the difference and the p value. Um, then let's move to the introduction. Uh, they are in the Consort 2010 checklist. They expect authors to mention the scientific background and explanation of rationale and specific objectives and hypotheses. They have described quite adequately, and they have mentioned that early integration of palliative care found to be effective on improvement of quality of life of patients with advanced diseases compared to the late initiation, and more studies generated evidence limited to the quality of life at early phase of the disease, but not at the end of life. So the study objective was clearly mentioned that uh, the objective is to uh, identify the early integration of palliative care in oncology influence of on quality of life at the end of life at the, and the use of healthcare resources near the end of life. Then let's move to the methods. 
um, in the uh, checklist, the trial design, the description of the trial design, including the, including the allocation ratio and important changes to the methods of trial commencement with reason should be given in the article. The trial design was very briefly described here. They just mentioned that they randomly assigned participants to, to each arm. Uh, uh, according to the description, we can guess it is a parallel arm design. But the allocation ratio was not mentioned in the article. But here in this flow uh, diagram, we can see that there are equal uh, number of participants in each arm. In the uh, control arm, there are 94 uh, participants, and in the uh, uh, intervention arm, there are 92. So the allocation ratio is one to one. But there were no changes to the eligibility criteria of intervention done after the trial commencement. In the checklist, under the participants, the eligibility, eligibility criteria for participants and the settings and allocation where the data were collected should be given. Here in this article, the eligibility criteria was comprehensively described and the study was conducted in the hospital, uh, University Hospital, Belgium. These are the inclusion and exclusion criteria given in the article. They are the patients with solid tumor treated at medical oncology department, thoracic oncology department, or digestive oncology department of the hospital, and patients within 12 weeks of new diagnosis, and patients with the life expectancy of approximately one year, and patients with this Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group performance status uh, between zero to two, and patients with ability to read and comprehensively uh, respond to the questions in Dutch were included then patients under 18 years and patients with impaired cognition were excluded from the study. In the consort 2010 checklist under the intervention, the intervention for each group with sufficient details to allow replication, including how and when they were uh, actually administered should be described. The intervention was described in this article briefly, but the, but the reference was given to read the full intervention because they have published a, a research a protocol in a BMC Health Services Research Journal. And uh, this is the uh, uh, BMC uh, article which shows the full detail of the uh, uh, intervention, where the participants assigned to the intervention arm was consulted by a palliative care nurse within the three weeks of enrollment, and then uh, they have given monthly appointment for the intervention arm people, and they focus more on the illness understanding, symptom burden, provided support in decision making, support for emotional, social, and spiritual needs in, for the intervention arm patients. Then in the consort checklist under the item six, completely defined pre-specified primary and secondary outcome measures, including how and when they were assessed and any changes to the trial outcomes after the trial mm -hmm. commencement with reason should be given. Here, the primary and secondary outcomes were well defined in this article. Uh, the primary outcome is mm -hmm. the quality of life at and at the end of life at six, three, and one month uh, uh, prior to the death. Uh, and it was measured at baseline 12 weeks and six weekly thereafter until the death. This was assessed using two tools. One is URTC QLQ C30, and the other one is McGill Quality of Life Questionnaire. The secondary outcome is the healthcare use near the end of life. Here, the last 30 days of life was considered uh, in this uh, calculation, and it was assessed using eight indicators, and one, uh, one point was given for every indicator. And other than that, they have generated composite aggressive end-of-life care score using six indicators as well. These are the indicators they consider to uh, calculate the healthcare use near the end of life. And uh, there are the uh, any, any emergency room visits, any hospital admissions, more than two hospital admissions, more than 40 days of hospitalization, hospital death and ICU admission, systematic treatment and palliative care unit admissions were considered. <clears throat> Uh, for the composite uh, score generation, only six indicators were considered that, that are death in the hospital, two emergency room visits, two hospital admissions, more than 14 days of hospitalization, and ICU admission and receipt of chemotherapy. Other than the consult 2010 checklist uh, items, under the item 6A, there are 10 uh, additional items given in the 2022 extension. 
here the provision of, of a rationale for the selection of the domain for the trial primary outcome was given in this article as we described earlier and the description for the specific measurement of variable and analy uh, analytic matrix uh, uh, was given uh, but method of aggregation was not described adequately in this article and time for, point for each outcome was mentioned clearly if the analysis matrix for the primary outcome uh, presence within a participant change, define and justify the minimal important change in the individual was expected in the new extension, but which was not there in this uh, current article. Mm, uh, and the item number 6A4 is not relevant to our current article. And the 6A5 uh, uh, is if outcome assessment were for performed at several time points after randomization, state the time points used for the analysis. As we described earlier, uh, they, are, uh, they have clearly mentioned the time points used for the uh, outcome analysis. Mm -hmm. And if a composite outcome was used, define all individual components of the composite outcome. As we described earlier, it was given in this article identify any outcomes that were not pre-specified in the trial registry or trial protocol. Uh, there were no such changes done and pro provide a description of the study instruments used to assess the outcome. Uh, yes, they have done uh, a description on the instrument, but they were, they were not provided the reliability, validity, and responsiveness in a population similar to the study sample along with that instrument description. And describe who assess the outcome and any, any qualifications or trial specific training necessity to administer this uh, instrument was not uh, given in this article and describe any pro process used to promote outcome data quality during the data collection uh, and uh, was done. They, are, they have uh, used two tools rather than using one tool to assess the quality of life, which, uh, which was done to enhance the quality of data. But after the data collection, uh, there were no uh, any data uh, improvement method. Uh, in the concert 2010 checklist under the sample size, they expect to give how sample size was determined when, and when applicable explanation of any interim analysis and stopping guidelines should be mentioned. Here they have mentioned that they, are, they have used a sample size of 186 calculated using quality of life at 12 weeks. But other than that, they have not given any description on the sample size calculation. And interim analysis or step, stopping guideline is not applicable for this study, so they have not mentioned anything regarding that. Then, uh, uh, in, in the checklist, they should define and justify the target differences between the treatment groups, and there are uh, no description on that as well. Uh, then the randomization. In the checklist, they should give method used to generate the random allocation sequence and type of randomization with detail of any restriction. They just mentioned that they have randomly assigned participants to the either arms, but there were no any description on random allocation sequence generation or any uh, type, uh, type of the randomization. But uh, here, mm -hmm. as we uh, discussed earlier, the number of participants in each arm are equal. So we can assume as it is a block randomization. And they have mentioned that they have stratified according to the department, but that is stratification details are not mentioned. In the checklist item nine, the allocation concealment mechanism, they have to uh, give a detailed description, but uh, they have not mentioned anything regarding the allocation concealment method uh, in this article. Then the implementation under the W uh, under the uh, consort 2010 checklist, who generated the random allocation sequence, who enrolled the participants, and who allocate assigned the participants to the intervention should be described, but there were no description in this article. And when we consider regarding as this is a complex in, uh, public health intervention, uh, uh, the blinding is not possible. Uh, so they have not used any blinding methods. 
uh, in uh, under the limit uh, lim study limitation section they have uh, mentioned that they were unable to uh, uh, use blinding because of this study type uh, in the consort 2010 checklist under the statistical method statistical method used to compare the groups for primary and secondary outcomes and method for additional analysis should be given uh, as we can see in this uh, article they have used intention to treat analysis they mentioned that the analysis was carried out according to the original randomization and the, for the primary outcome that means the quality of life near the end of life a terminal decline joint model was used it is a recent technique that has advantage of considering the dependence between quality of life and the survival while accounting for the missing data uh, for each point of interest, that means six, three, and one month prior to death, a model-based 95% confidence interval for the mean outcome score was presented in this article. For the secondary outcome, that is the healthcare use near the end of life, logistic regression was used. The observed proportions were reported in combination with Wilson's score 95% confidence intervals. Other than this basic analysis, they carried out the analysis for stratification and factor as well. Um, uh, from here onwards, my colleague will discuss the results section. Thank you. Uh, according to the consort guideline, uh, the, uh, the participant show is the next item. The diagram is only recommended. And uh, for each group, the numbers of participants who were randomly assigned received intended treatment and were analyzed for primary outcome. And for each group, losses and exclusions after randomization together with the reason. Now, in this uh, article, this uh, participant flow is given. Um, part, uh, uh, with uh, participants assigned, received intervention and measured the primary outcome. With number completed the baseline survey and number completed one or more uh, more follow up visit. The losses and exclusions after randomization with reasons are also given. It would have been better if the number included to analyze the uh, terminal uh, dec uh, decline model, that is, the number died after 12 weeks, was also shown here. It was it is not shown here. Uh, uh, it is not shown here in the uh, diagram, but uh, in the text it was mentioned. Uh, the recruitment, the date defining the periods of recruitment and follow-up and why the trial ended uh, over stop. The period of recruitment is mentioned as uh, uh, 29th April and period of follow-up was mentioned as two, uh, from 29th April to 29th uh, February 2016. Uh, and the reason to see uh, um, um, and, and the follow-up was done by, by uh, 8 November 2017. And the reason to select this particular day to stop the uh, follow-up was not mentioned uh, in this article. Baseline data, a table showing baseline demographic and clinical characteristics for each group. Uh, the Table 1 shows this uh, baseline data. Uh, the demographic data, gender, age, and education, recruited department, uh, Medical Oncology, Digestive Oncology and Thoracic Oncology, Clinical Characteristics, EO, ECOG Performance Status and Tumor Site, and Primary Outcome, the Quality of Life, are shown uh, at the baseline for two, both the groups. And number analyzed. For each group, number of participants, denominator included in each analysis and whether the analysis was by original assigned group. Now, Quality of Life near the end of life, the numbers mentioned for each group in general. Uh, it is mentioned that the intervention group, there were 94 uh, people and uh, 73 patients who have died uh, are included. And control group, there were 91 and among uh, which uh, 74 patients had died and they were included. The denominators at 6 months, 3 months and 1 month were not mentioned in the analysis. It should they, uh, It is better if that was mentioned. 
and uh, use of data, uh, healthcare resources, uh, denominator is mentioned uh, uh, at the top of the table, as you can see in this figure. And uh, as Dr. Kiranti mentioned, analysis was done according to the original assigned groups, uh, and it was mentioned in the uh, methodology section. Outcomes and estimations for each primary and secondary outcome, results for each group, and the estimated defect size and its specific such as 95% confidence interval and for binary outcomes presentation of both absolute and relative effect prices is recommended uh, uh, in the consort uh, guide. Uh, quality of life near the end of life. Uh, result for each group was not shown separately in numbers but the difference was shown with defect size and precision and there was a graphical presentation uh, of the result uh, of each group, it is, uh, but it is difficult to obtain the exact numbers if one is, uh, someone is interested from these figures. Uh, now, uh, I will uh, take you through the results. Uh, quality of life near the end of life. Difference between global health status and quality of life of the uh, EORPC quality of uh, life questionnaire C30. Uh, six months prior to that, it was, uh, the difference was uh, 5.9. Uh, three months prior to that, in difference was 6.8, and one month prior to that was uh, 7.6. Um, difference between global uh, health status um, uh, is increasing towards the day. And the difference uh, from uh, within the, uh, uh, the, the, the control arm and the uh, intervention arm, and difference in single item scale, uh, six months prior to that was 1.2, three months prior to that it was 1.6, and one month prior to that it was 0.6. And difference of summary score of M MQOL, uh, six months prior to that it was 0.6, three months prior to that it was 0.7, and one month prior to that also it was 0.7. Uh, again, which is which has uh, increased uh, towards the end of life. Use of healthcare resources at the end of life, result for each group and the estimated effect size and its precision is given in a table. This is shown for any emergency room visits, any hospital admission, uh, equal or more than two hospital admissions, more than 14 days of hospitalization, hospital death, and ICU admission, systematic treatment, palliative care unit admission. And none of the uh, di differences were uh, significant uh, between the uh, two groups. And aggressive EOL care Results for each group and estimated effect size and its precision is given in the same table. Uh, where they have presented this one, um, uh, the healthcare resources, and no difference between the two groups. Since this was described separate, uh, separate in the text, we suggest uh, that it would be better if this was shown separately or emphasized more in the presentation. <laughs> And similarly, results of any other analysis performed, including subgroup analysis and adjusted analysis, distinguishing pre from exploratory, and the consort outcomes 2022 extension checklist item for description of ancillary analysis, it mentioned that in 18.1, if there were any analysis that were not pre specified, to explain why they were performed. Now, uh, in this uh, report, no ancillary analysis were reported, but it was reported that the analysis for quality of life near included yeah. after the development of protocol yeah. as the researchers were not aware of such a model at the time of development of, of yeah. protocol and the justification for including this one was given in the methodology section uh, nicely. Yeah. Harm, all important harms and unintended effects of in this group uh, uh, should be um, described. Harms or unintended effects in each group were not discussed in this article. It may not be applicable for this study, that's what we uh, can assume, but better if that is mentioned as none in the article. Now we will move to the next section, discussion. Limitations. Now, trial limitations addressing so uh, sources of potential bias, imprecision, and if relevant, multiplicity of analysis uh, should be reported. Trial limitations were discussed in this report. Um, samples, uh, the, the, the limitations described were the sample size was not calculated to evaluate quality of life near death. It was calculated for quality of life at 12 weeks. And they have mentioned clearly that it, it as an limitation. 
and full blinding of patients, clinicians, and assessors was not possible that they have accepted and mentioned as a possible source of bias. All the data would not have captured from the chart for use of resources. They have mentioned the alternatives that they would have adopted. And if someone is, uh, else is uh, interested in doing a similar sort of research, the, uh, they have suggested what to be done. And patients' preferences of end-of-life care was not considered uh, in uh, giving this intervention that also might have caused some bias to the result. The differences of the baseline characteristics of the study group and control group, that is gender, education, ECAG performance status and tumor size was not identified as a limitation at in the uh, 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 in the uh, table one of the uh, paper. The, uh, the uh, it was the the results were shown and uh, the p values or the differences between the groups were not shown. But this was not identified uh, by them as a limitation. Generalizability. Uh, uh, external validity and applicability of the trial findings. Generalized will give us discuss consistency of with literature on lower quality of life and depth approaches in both groups uh, was uh, mentioned as one reason uh, if this can uh, be generalized. And they also have mentioned the inconsistency with other studies in failing to show a reduced use of health care resources at EOL. They have discussed the differences in the current intervention versus other interventions, which would have caused this as a the physician led uh, analysis uh, or the physician led interventions in other studies, and this study was a nurse led intervention. Applicability of trial findings was also discussed, increasing differences in quality of life between the two groups over time with the uh, largest discrepancy at one month prior death. Uh, this shows the importance of early integration of palliative care on, 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 in oncology. Next item in the consort checklist is the interpretation. Uh, interpretation consistent with results, balancing benefits and harms, and considering our other relevant evidence. The conclusion on early integration of palliative care in oncology as opposed to palliative care on demand results in improved quality of life at end of life. This is the benefit of the study and which consists with the results. No difference in healthcare utilization at uh, uh, end of life. That is also consistent with the results. No difference in aggressiveness of end of life care. That is also consistent with the results. And recommended more research is needed with regard to com uh, components of early integrated palliative care to less use of healthcare resources. Other literature or evidence was also used to arrive at this recommendation. We will move to the uh, next uh, items in the uh, consort checklist. Uh, these are the other information. Uh, registration number is shown, uh, uh, and the way it is registered is shown. The, uh, uh, the protocol where the full trial protocol can be accessed is if available. The reference is given in the study procedure, and you can access that uh, separately, uh, the, the protocol. And funding is also shown. Uh, where the funding came for the study. Now, uh, Dr. Kiran will discuss the main findings of the study. There are two main findings of this study. The first one is early integration of palliative care in oncology results in improved quality of life at the end of life as opposed to the palliative care on demand. It was clearly given in this article as that six months prior to death, the difference of quality of life is 5.9 with the p-value of 0 0.03. And three months before the death, the quality of life difference is 6.8 with the p-value of 0 0.02. And the highest difference is at the one month prior to death, 
it is 7.6 with the p value of 0 0.03 as a, as a, as the main purpose of the palliative care is to improve the quality of life of patients this study clearly shows the importance of early initiation of palliative care for cancer patients the second finding is the early integration of palliative care in oncology does not reduce the use of healthcare resources at the end of life. This is a, a controversial with the uh, previous evidence. Uh, this may uh, this uh, may be result due to the methodological limitations in this study. They have used secondary data to assess the healthcare use near the end of life for the patients who have died uh, by the end of the study, and this may have an effect. Uh, on this calculation. So we need further studies to clarify this uh, fact. So my colleague will discuss the applicability of the findings to the Sri Lanka. Thank you, Mr. Um, uh, um, let me uh, take you to the applicability of the findings to Sri Lanka. Now, similar intervention at field level can be um, uh, tried out in Sri Lanka. Uh, using the services of public health nursing officers. We have such a category. And this palliative care is with the scope of PHNO's job description. Uh, we need to develop guidelines and protocols for this. And we need to uh, thorough training on relevant care guidelines and protocols for this uh, PHNO. This can always, uh, we can, uh, they can always refer the patients to specialized units for further advice on care and adhere to advice received in the management. And uh, the use of healthcare resources and the cost is country and context specific. Uh, this may influence by culture, health seeking behaviors, availability of services in healthcare institutions, and cost of the services. Um, obviously, the situation in Belgium uh, will not be the situation of Sri Lanka. So, we need further studies on early integration of palliative care and oncology and use of healthcare resources at the end of life for Sri Lanka. To assess this and uh, to incorporate uh, these findings to our day-to-day uh, -day work. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I would like to thank um, uh, Dr. Buddhika Mahesh uh, for guiding uh, us uh, to, from this to this uh, entire process and pushing us to do this somehow or other. And uh, I also would like to uh, thank both the colleges, which most of us are members in uh, the College of Palliative Medicine of Sri Lanka, where I represent today, and also the College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka. Um, and the um, uh, uh, review panel, Dr. Shankar Salagala, Dr. Subha Pereira, Dr. Uttala Mohandira, and our moderator today, Dr. Dakshila Galapati, and all the participants. Yes, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Arvind and Dr. Kudansi. And now the floor is open for questions and comments. Thank you for the nice presentation for, from colleagues. And uh, may I ask more question that uh, how can we uh, find the randomization method? Can we deliberate more on that when they have not mentioned that uh, how we can find the randomization method from the trial? Thank you, Niroda, for that question. Um, actually, randomization is a method where all the participants has equal probability to uh, uh, get selected into uh, one either of the arms. So there are mainly uh, four types of randomization techniques, that is simple randomization, block randomization, stratified randomization, and cluster randomization. In uh, simple randomization, uh, uh, the participants are uh, randomized, uh, but uh, they are the, uh, in each arm, uh, the number of participants are not equal. That means uh, the number in one arm may not be equal to the number in the other. In the block randomization, uh, 
uh, there are the participants are usually uh, in each chance are more or less equal uh, in number. Uh, so uh, in uh, he is this is study, uh, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, there are, we can see that in uh, intervention now there are 92 participants and in the control arm there are 94 participants so uh, 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 we can assume that it uh, it is uh, the block randomization they have used here and also they have used stratification as well because these uh, on, uh, patients were uh, recruited from three oncology departments uh, and uh, they have uh, stratified according to these uh, departmental factors uh, so uh, uh, this uh, block uh, together with the block randomization they have used this stratification as well in this study uh, i hope this uh, answer your question yes thank you so much for the clarification. thank you uh, i am dr sogaj from cancer control program uh, congratulations to in relation to the applicability in such intervention in sri lanka so do you think the current PHNO card will be adequate to implement the interventions in Sri Lanka? We have two questions together. Uh, can you uh, tell the, uh, repeat the question? Again? Actually, my question is, I have a question. Uh, so do you think the current PHNO card will be adequate to implement the intervention in Sri Lanka? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, yes, it's not adequate uh, for, for us to implement this uh, countrywide. But at the moment, we have recruited some uh, PHNOs and they are in service. Uh, what we can do is using them, we can try out this and study the results and then uh, use that as a evidence-based, uh, take an evidence-based approach to advocate the, uh, the the higher authorities to recruit more PHNOs for this sort of care. Because now, uh, if, if you might not uh, know that NCD and cancer gets, usually they get uh, an enormous amount of money from the budget, budgetary allocation. So uh, with, with the evidence and with showing that money and the uh, need for this palliative care, I think the Ministry of Health can advocate more the higher authorities, including the treasury, to uh, push them to recruit more PHNOs in future. And we had one question from Dr. Suraj Karera, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aravind and Dr. Chiganti for excellent presentation on reviewing the very important uh, randomized control trial related to uh, palliative care and, and at the end of life care also. Now, uh, this is very applicable. We, we, we can ap apply these the findings with, uh, adapt into our setting. Now, uh, uh, in relation to Sri Lankan setting, now when we look at our mortality data, cancer mortality data, about uh, one third is dying at the hospital setting and two thirds are dying at the home setting. So when, uh, according to the Registrar General Statistics, uh, about 15,000 deaths are related to cancer. So uh, uh, from there, only 5,000 deaths are occurring in the hospital. So therefore, uh, uh, palliative care uh, at the end of life care need to be introduced both in the community setting and the palliative uh, hospital setting both. Now, uh, in the hospital setting, uh, now uh, in the oncology units, most of the oncology units now, they are considering palliative care as one of uh, one of the major interventions and it is it integrated within the oncology care also and most of the settings now they have developed uh, palliative care consult services and they are attending and initiating but uh, that need to be further enhanced with uh, advanced care plan and uh, that information need to be uh, communicated to the uh, lower down uh, the primary care institution uh, up to the PHN also now from cancer control side we have introduced the shared care booklet to document this advanced care plan. Then, then all all lower down uh, uh, hospitals and uh, the PHN up to PHN are aware about uh, the advanced care plan. But uh, all oncology settings, it is not implemented. So we, from our end also, we are trying our best. Even though so many circulars, so many instructions are given, actually it is not happening. So we need to implement that thing. As well as regarding the uh, uh, 
uh, other important thing is uh, since palliative care goes beyond cancer, we need to emphasize uh, that uh, palliative care interventions need to be uh, introduced to other uh, non-communicable diseases also. And uh, uh, other thing is, uh, as Dr. Aravinda clearly mentioned, uh, currently we have only 150 palliative care nurses, two batches are in the field and another 90 is on training, the final training. So altogether around 250 is at the moment. It is not adequate to cover the entire country. So phase out manner, we need to expand the PHNO care services also thinking about offering palliative care services at the community level up to the home base level. So therefore this article, uh, we can uh, evidence we can utilize to convince the relevant uh, authorities to importance of investing on palliative care. So that uh, the second component with the health system uh, is benefited is a little bit uh, uh, not, not supportive of this article, but there are so many other articles which has clearly shown that both individual pa uh, patient quality of life improvement as well as health systems uh, is benefited reducing number for emergency care admissions and those things. So there are so many other articles which is supporting for the, uh, uh, the second evidence. So those are my some observations. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, comment. Thank you for all the questions. Now, if there are no more, we will go on to the comments um, by the review panel members. I would first like to uh, invite Dr. Uttala <coughs> Mohandaram to give her comments as a peer reviewer. Uh, first, uh, I would like to congratulate both the presenters, uh, Dr. Aravinda and Dr. Chiranti, for delivering this comprehensive presentation. Uh, as you both accurately pointed out, there were some shortcomings in the methodology of this study. Uh, the explanation of sample size calculation was unclear, and insufficient precautions were taken to minimize bias. I appreciate this insightful critique uh, and it has been a valuable learning opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uttana. I would like to now invite Dr. Subha Pereira to give her comments. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me congratulate our two presenters for doing the, such an excellent presentation. Uh, and also just, uh, they have just gone to the extent of reading the article, not only the article, the other publication as well. There had been, I understand that there are two publications uh, they have, where they have uh, analyzed the primary outcome, sorry, primary outcome and the uh, uh, this is the second publication where they have analyzed the secondary uh, outcome as the death. And uh, as we just witnessed, this is general clubs are not only critical appraising uh, place, they, they have uh, a, appreciating evidence also. And uh, we uh, analyze with the relevance to our day-to-day -day practice as well. Um, the other thing is the intervention has clearly been mentioned here, I think, early on systematic integration of palliative care that has been the intervention. The other thing was, uh, I just wanted to uh, highlight now, this publication has the outcome is the death. So uh, they have, a and the quality of life, and they have used, uh, in addition to quality of life tools, they have used the routinely collected data also. And uh, they are in 20, 2021, there is consort routine. Um, uh, there's an amendment in consort uh, guidelines adding to routine databases also. So we could have uh, add that point to the our uh, analysis as well. And uh, just for an interest sake, uh, 
Now, our uh, Thai population had been the Dutch speaking population in Belgium. Uh, what is the proportion of Dutch speaking population in Belgium? Do we have any idea? Just for interest sake. Okay, it's 60%, it's 59%. French speaking uh, uh, population, there is 40%, and German 1%. There are three languages spoken, right? Uh, I think that's all. That those are my thoughts. Uh, I will hand over to Dakshila. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Suba. Now I would like to invite Dr. Shankar Thalagala to give her comments. Right. Uh, thank you so much uh, for both the presenters and also the supporters of all the logistics. Uh, well, actually, the presenters, both uh, Dr. Chiranti and Dr. Ravinda, did a wonderful job. Uh, congratulations on that. And you highlighted many of the things that even I have noticed while going through the article. So uh, let me now, since it is a journal club, just uh, give me some uh, let me give me some uh, give you all some thoughts out from my side. Now, they have clearly uh, presented the proposal in another article. Now, even if you do uh, certain systematic reviews or even RCTs, you would do all, you also would do the same. So, in that case, when you are reviewing an article with the results, you have to take that article as well and review together, right? So, of course, yes, you correctly, very correctly found out that you know certain things are missing in this particular article where they have presented the results or the findings of the study right but then again uh, details of the you know especially this one-to-one -one randomization and all that is given nicely in the proposal if you had gone through I'm, I'm sure you have gone through the proposal but it is there so therefore you can of course if you just look at this particular article per se and say it is not there yes that's correct but they have given the reference for the reader to understand you know that it has been published elsewhere so then when you're reviewing the article you have to review along with that so of course yes if it was not mentioned in the uh, protocol publication also then yes you could have spoken about that you know into that extent uh, so that is one thing so those articles uh, you know those details were there but then of course as you very correctly found out uh, how the concealment of randomization, who did the randomization, and all those things were not clear. But again, who did the randomization is given in the second article, the one that you all reviewed, in acknowledgments. Because the authors acknowledged the person who did the randomization, right? But, uh, you know, why and how, of course, those things were not there. Yes, that is agreed. So, uh, yeah, so you found out very uh, correctly those things. And uh, of course, in the protocol, again, they're talking about assessing the, because see, when you look at the definition of quality of life, it is not only the patient's quality of life, even the caretaker's quality of life, right? So in the protocol, they also talk about assessing the quality of life of the caretakers. And it was not mentioned at all <clears throat> in the uh, the second article where they present their results. So yes, that is again, maybe they have, they will, or I don't know whether they have already done it, but maybe they were planning at that particular time to present it in another article that could have been there. But uh, that is something that again, because since the protocol of the study has been given somewhere else and you're reviewing the whole study together, that is also another point that you all, uh, you know, that we could uh, talk about. Uh, other than that, I think uh, you all have uh, discussed so many things and it was a new statistical method, uh, the the new one, sorry, I forgot the name now, with the declining of, yeah, uh, where we discuss about the declining of quality of life nearing the death, right? So that is the new one. If I don't know whether you have read the article, it is, it is very fascinating if you had read that uh, article on the statistical analysis. Uh, it is very difficult to understand. Even I found it a little bit difficult to understand, but it's a very nice article where you really assess how the quality of life uh, decreases with uh, as you come closer to death and you uh, how do you adjust to it, right? So that is, again, as you know, 
as public health people, as you know, people who really do statistics about uh, biological statistics, sorry, biostatistics uh, related to health. That is also another new method that we can uh, start practicing, in, especially when it comes to palliative care as well as uh, cancer. Not only malignant palliative care, also not malign non malignant palliative care, because in that article they say that analysis can be even utilized for any chronic disease uh, even for non-malignant palliative care so I think that is another very good eye-opener for me at least so thank you whoever selected this article thank you very much for selecting it so there were many things for me to learn as well so I think uh, again uh, so those are my thoughts of course and uh, yes let me congratulate for uh, to both the presenters very well done and uh, Yes, as Dr. Aravinda said, we can integrate these findings into the system. And then again, looking back uh, at the current situation or the prevailing situation in the sense, not only the human resources, other logistics as well. As Dr. Surad Pera so very correctly mentioned, we have many lapses to be filled. So I suppose, uh, I think there is a new batch coming up. Uh, who's thinking of new study areas. I think this is a very good study area that you all can study on. So those are my thoughts. Thank you again very much uh, for the two presenters for a wonderful job done and all the teamwork that the, uh, you know, your team did in logistic arrangements and all that. And I would like to thank the presidents and the council of both the colleges, College of uh, Community Physicians of Sri Lanka and College of Palliative Medicine of Sri Lanka. And of course, uh, Dr. Buddhika Mahesh for arranging this and also for inviting me to be a reviewer. Thank you. Thank you, Anara. Now we will conclude today's donor club. Congratulations to the presenters, Dr. Arvinda Vikramasimha and Dr. Jagdana Singha for a job well done. And also a big thank you to the review panel members, Dr. Shankar Tharagala, Dr. Subha Pereira and Dr. Ispala Mohandira for their valuable inputs and joining with us amidst their very busy schedules. And also be thank you to the College of Community Physicians and the College of Palliative Medicine of Sri Lanka for organizing the dinner club and also to all the participants for joining in. Hope to see you all next time as well. Have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Bye.